welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast. This is David Bonson. For those of you watching the video, I am uh, in my apartment here in New York City. Uh, I don't have all of our fancy recording equipment set up, but I think this will do the trick. And I'm uh, I'm fresh off of a flight from Southern California into New York, landed in the middle of the night, and I'm literally walking out the door to my apartment momentarily. Uh, where I'll be spending the day at the Blackstone Alternative Assets Symposium here in the city uh, for seven sessions centered around various aspects of alternative investing. Uh, it'll be a wonderful and intellectually stimulating day. But um, I want to obviously give you all our normal Dividend Cafe commentary. What a week it's been. As I sit here Thursday morning, and because, of course, it's New York City, we're several hours still from the market opening here in Eastern Time Zone. Uh, but the market is set to open up approximately 100 points. The market's been up on the week. Uh, you know, not, not huge, kind of a muted response, but nevertheless a net-net positive um, the biggest positive day being on Tuesday in response to kind of a strong start to earnings season. And so in terms of where we stand with, with the market, it, you have the trade deal, phase one trade deal that was verbally uh, reached last weekend, pretty much in, into the Friday afternoon time period. And we did a special Dividend Cafe um, podcast discussion with my whole investment committee about that Monday, and I'd commend it to you. But I want to recap just at least a few of the highlights and our takeaways as to where we think things stand right now. We do believe that this is a net positive, that it was much better than it could have been. We don't think it is earth shattering. Uh, the deal is not yet written. It is not yet signed. Nevertheless, they seem to be on a trajectory where some of the obvious things are incorporated. China's increasing their commitments of agricultural purchases. Uh, the U.S. is not going to escalate the planned tariff increases for October. We believe by the time they sign the deal in November, they will also pull back the planned tariff escalations for December. So the two of those things coming off the table put together represents um, what could have been in between 25 and $30 billion of additional taxes on the American economy in the form of tariffs on Chinese imports. Um, already what was not escalated was over $12 billion. So these are sizable um, uh, uh, situations in terms of what could have been. Now, the market responded favorably, but again, I think you have a really classic case of how markets work as discounting mechanisms here, in that most of the idea that this trade war would not be getting worse in the short term had been priced into markets on the edges. Some things about the deal may have struck the market as better than expected. The market moved a little higher, but the market didn't explode higher. This isn't a final deal. Intellectual property theft is not addressed. National security interests are not addressed. The, the kind of long-term substance that will really represent a comprehensive deal is not there yet. And I think that the market's disdain for uncertainty means that as long as there's some uncertainty out there, you have to count on some continued volatility. For one thing, we could very well have this phase one mini deal fall apart. You just don't know the way this stuff has gone and the kind of um, impulsiveness and, and unpredictability of the whole situation. I mean that both politically and economically, the various actors involved, where it could go. Now, in terms of the impact to the U.S. economy, um, I think you have to remember, they go, well, they're, they're committing to you know, billions of dollars of additional purchases of product from farmers. Why wouldn't that be a huge boon to our agricultural industry? Um, a lot of that is just the restoration of purchases that were already taking place. And to the degree that there is some marginal additiveness to it, um, it is not something that is earth shattering. And so that's the reason. But no, I am in the camp that views this positively. Um, and yet 
uh, I think you have to be wary until we get to the finish line of a comprehensive deal. And, and that prudence has been uh, rather reinforced throughout the, the last um, year and a half as this has been all playing out. Now, earnings season is the other big uh, story that will kind of impact markets here in the short term. And what I'm going to ask you to do, for those of you listening to the podcast right now, is bear with me a few minutes. I want to give you a kind of update on, on Brexit and on earnings season. I think we've covered where we are with this phase one China trade deal. But I really want to close out the podcast with something that is a bit longer term in focus, that is not about what's going to move the markets this week. Okay, the the yield curve has uninverted for now. The three month yield has come uh, about six, seven basis points lower than the 10 year yield. And that had been mostly inverted over the last um, two months, let's call it. I think that that is um, short term relevant. It it speaks to where we are there. There the expectation is still that the Fed will cut, although that expectation has come down a little bit here in their uh, late October meeting. I think that um, the yield curve, the trade war, and, and earnings season and Brexit are significant. They're not um, hype. They're not uh, so much of what gets covered, unfortunately, in financial media is often not a real story. I'm not suggesting these things are not real stories. They are, but I want you to bear with me because I want to conclude our Dividend Cafe today with something that I think is the real story and, and various ramifications of it um, represent the kind of significant economic story of, of the decade ahead and I would suggest probably two or three decades ahead. I mean that very literally. Um, so to wrap things up more around where we're kind of looking right now, this market that is in kind of a bit of a trading range, um, Dow's back above 27,000. Uh, it has a higher baseline right now. It, it, around a year ago, we were trying to, we were moving up and down uh, around 25,000. So, so markets have improved substantively. It's been a very strong year in capital markets, but that came off of a challenging fourth quarter of last year. Um, and, and of course, the Fed has had to come become accommodative in order for a lot of this re-rating of risk assets to take place. Uh, that, uh, that uncertainty of the trade war has impacted markets. The Brexit issues are getting interesting. As, um, as uh, I was going to bed very late last night off of a, a late flight into JFK, and then even very early this morning, the um, reports are that there is apparently a deal ready to be struck with the European Union and the UK. Prime Minister Johnson and EU have come to some understanding that hang up in the deal had to do with Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is not necessarily on board, and so you don't really know how this is going to play out in the summit over the weekend. But their deadline for a uh, Brexit deadline, uh, for a, for a fin- finality around Brexit, is two weeks from today as I'm recording. And it appears they've made more progress to that end than we have up till now had. But that's by no means a fait accompli. And in fact, there is a decision tree chart. Like if they do this, then this, and this could happen and and so forth at DividendCafe.com that was prepared by one of our research partners that I have to tell you is absolutely fantastic. Please check it out. There's the possibility of an overhang of instability around or uncertainty around Brexit outcome coming off. That's more than likely positive for markets. Phase one China deal, uh, let's call it 30 billion of planned tariff escalations not happening, positive for markets, but you have earnings season. And now um, we're we're far too early to be able to get a read on how things are going. And a handful of companies, including very large ones, have already reported net-net. It's been a positive start to earnings season, especially with some of the financial names. Um, However, we'll know more in a week and we'll know even more than that in two weeks because you need more time and more um, diversification of sectors and companies to report to get a feel for the guidance going forward into what earnings uh, and what revenues and what you know companies are projecting. On the political front, the Democrats had a pretty significant debate this week. Um, I provided the chart of the week at Dividend Cafe 
the political odds in the prediction markets right now uh, for Elizabeth Warren securing the Democratic nomination. It looks more and more um, expected. There's so much that could still happen that could uh, throw that off. And I think that in the politics and money section of DividendCafe.com, I lay out what exactly are the various unknowns that would have to kind of play out. We don't know that Senator Warren will in fact receive the Democrat nomination, although she is now clearly in the lead and it appears that former Vice President Joe Biden is declining a bit. But um, she was hit a little bit in the debates this week. There are some vulnerabilities in her campaign and her thesis. And uh, we, you know, you have to allow for this to play out a little. However, I would suggest that the, um, I would suggest that the odds are that that, that are correct, that Liz Warren wound up being the Democrat nominee. And I think that um, you have, in order for markets to be able to assess some of these things, and I've said this time and time again, um, I really believe that the Senate becomes the bigger market story. Even with a Democrat Senate, I'm not at all convinced that some of the far extreme notions would actually be codified into law. Um, and there'll be so much devil in details things to go on. But why do the markets in October of 2019 not fear uh, the idea of the imposition of a wealth tax, the uh, imposition of Medicare for all and the cost to be associated with that? Um, some of the very severe restrictions she's proposing in financial transactions, in financial regulation, on private equity, uh, things that would be very constrictive to capital markets. Why are uh, risk assets not pricing that stuff in 13, 14, 15 months in advance? Because it, it, they're way too smart to, way too smart. They know there's so much between now and then. Um, certainly there are some outcomes that could play out based on a chain of events leading to them that would be extremely negative for markets and, and the, we're just not at that time right now. So that's the nature of politics and, and uh, we will continue discussing all aspects of politics and your money all the way through the 2020 election. Let me close Dividend Cafe with an economic lesson. This is something that I'm obsessed with. I've been studying it for most of my adult life. Um, I've transitioned, not, not, um, transition may not be the right word, I've evolved in some understandings of certain aspects of this, but I felt like I had an opportunity this week to simplify the way I would summarize something for those of you who care. I think we talk about the impact of negative interest rates quite a bit at Dividend Cafe. I think we talk about the deflationary spiral that excessive debt, both in America, but particularly around the world, Japan and Europe come to mind. Um, the deflationary spiral they've created macroeconomically. We talk about what this low interest rate environment means for risk assets, what it means for debt management, what it means for economic health, what it means for productivity, all these different things. What um, I think I'm in for is a almost uh, permanent, um, from a vantage point of my lifetime, a very constant and secular cycle of low interest rates. And right now, there is an absolute majority of people who believe that's a good thing, and they are wrong, and they are fatally wrong. Now, fortunately, there are enough um, folks out there that understand what I'm about to say, that this is not just going to pass without any controversy or go through without any kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, I guess, impact. But, but let me put it this way, um, low interest rates are said to be a net positive because they stimulate spending or they stimulate economic activity. But in fact, what very low interest rates do is disincentivize saving. And over the long term, there's absolutely no question that your savings has to equal investment. And to the degree that you constrict savings, you constrict investment, which is the sin qua non of productivity. You cut 
off the tree that produces the fruit of economic growth. So in order to have a, a long-term cycle of productivity, you need investment. And in order to have investment, you have to have savings. That is an economic law of identity. Savings long-term equals investment. Uh, to the extent that we are using a short-term manipulation policy tool to manage the impact of excessive debt, not even counting, the crowding out effect and the misallocation of capital that excessive debt rec uh, represents, just in the basis of the low interest rates and what they represent, I believe we've created a situation in where we favor already existing risk assets that, that they boost up the value of some uh, uh, real estate, some stock, some company, private, you know, risk asset that's already in play. And we fail to understand how we disincentivize the creation of new assets. How can that be a good thing for investors? So I want to be able to allocate client capital over the next decade and two decades and three decades with an understanding of the debt cycle, with an understanding of capital flows, with an understanding of how the, this sort of Japanification has created a negative feedback loop of low interest rates that then foster low growth rates. And what that looks like to risk assets could be very positive in periods of time, but it, it re, um, uh, paints the canvas for an economy. And I am adamant that most financial advisors are not thinking about it, understanding it, or prepared to apply it. Therefore, their allocation decisions, not to mention security selection decisions, are very vulnerable, either because of apathy, thoughtlessness, or um, it's entirely possible they get things right just by accident. And that is never sustainable. You want to get things right for the right reasons in order to have the expectation of sustainability. So this is a broader economic lesson. I've only teased around the edges with it, but I've been delving into this with Dividend Cafe for months. And I want to keep doing it because it is so much more important for those of you who have a timeline that is longer than one year than even the Brexit meetings this weekend or the trade meetings of China last weekend, which are important events in the news cycle and are important events to investors. However, there, um, I, 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 I simply am trying to draw a distinction between those things impacting markets in a one-year period and those things impacting markets in a multi-decade period. So I hope that's been helpful, I hope it's useful, but I really invite any questions you may have about it. And I uh, need to run out the door now and get to my uh, first set of meetings. And uh, we'll be out here in New York for um, over a week. A lot of, uh, it's our annual New York due diligence meeting. We're meeting with all of our major asset partners over the next week. Uh, uh, I promise you it's gonna be an unbelievably stimulating week intellectually for me, for uh, my uh, investment committee partners who are joining me. And we will be coming back to you with a lot more to chew on around it. But I thank you for listening to the Dividend Cafe podcast. Uh, I, I hope you got some out of it. I really appreciate uh, you listening and, and rating us and subscribing and, and reviewing us, if you will, and sharing with those who you want to hear it so we can grow this podcast. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.